Alright, A'udhu Billah Min Ash-Shaytan Ar-Rajim, Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Wa Salatu Wa Salamu Ala Sayyidina Wa Nabiyyina, Abil Qasim Al-Mustafa Muhammad, Wa Ala Ahli Baytihi Al-Tayyibin Al-Tahirin, Wa Al-Lanatu Al-Daimu Ala A'adaihim Ajma'in, Min Al-Ane Ila Qiyam Yawm Al-Din. Assalamu Alaikum, Brothers and Sisters, uh, Welcome to another one, of our live sessions i hope that uh everyone is doing well um and inshallah you guys have had a great week so as you know we have been continuing with the topic of salat the rulings of salat and also the secrets of salat um today i believe will be the last session uh that we will be discussing this particular part of salat because we'll be done we'll go through uh tashahud and salam today which are obviously the last two parts of uh, of the Salat. And then uh, after that, we're going to move on a little bit to Ta'qibat, and then we'll move on to the Mubtilat of Salat, the things that make our Salat batil. What are the things that we have to watch out for? There's quite a bit of things that uh, people think will make their Salat batil, and it doesn't. And there's also quite a bit of things that does make the Salat batil, and people are not aware of them. So that's a little bit of uh, what we are going to be uh, discussing as uh, we will be moving uh, forward. Today, inshallah, we have um, some very nice stuff to discuss regarding the asrar of salat and the secrets of salat. Particularly, the asrar of uh, tashahud is something that we have to discuss. The asrar of salam. Why is it called salam? Why do we have three different salams? Uh, which one of these three different salams are actually wajib for us to perform? Which one of them are mustahab? Um, and you'll see how that takes, uh, how that can affect um, some of the other rulings that we have in salat. Um, so that's what we'll be discussing today, and we'll also talk a little bit about some of the ta'ghibat of salat. When our salat ends, what are some of the short ta'ghibat? Uh, that we can do after our prayers. So like always, let me do a quick review of what we had discussed in the previous week. And then uh, we'll move on uh, from there, inshallah. So <clears throat> previous week, we discussed some rulings regarding sajda. We said that when it comes to sajda, there's one ruling that most people in fact do not know is that if you skip your sajda, you actually have to make up for it afterwards. We know that if we skip two sajdas in one uh, rakat, then obviously two sajdas is going to make your namaz batil if you miss both of them, right? Um, but this is if you miss one. If you miss one of these uh, sajdas, what are you supposed to do? Most people say, hey, it's not a rukna. So it's not my prayer is fine. And that's true. Your prayer is fine, except you have to make up for that sajda. That's why they have a section in their books called Qada of a Miss Sajda. So what is Qada of a Miss Sajda? Missed sajda? The Qada of a Miss Sajda basically is the idea where right after your namaz is done, and when I say your namaz is done, I'm talking about the salam part before you do the hands, right? Right after you give salam, you're just going to perform a sajda and you're going to make up for your sajda. So that's what you need to do. If someone says, I'll just redo my salat, that, that is haram because your namaz is not done yet, right? When you know you skipped a part of your namaz, technically you're still in your namaz until you add that part, right? So because of that, you can't just break off your salat and then go and start praying again. No, you have to do qada of that sajda and your namaz is in fact completely fine. You do not need to make up for it uh, at all, right? Um, so that was uh, Ayatollah Sistani's ruling. Um, uh, with regards to tashahud, we'll get to that in uh, today. So I'm not going to uh, discuss uh, what we said about um, tashahud. But for sajda, we do have to make up for it, right? And it's part of your salat. Okay. We also talked a little bit about this idea that if I'm going to sajda and I bump my head on the torba, what is the ruling? If you remember, Ayatollah Sistani said that uh, if you bump your head once, uh, then that's your first sajda. And it's just like you went to sajda and you forgot to say the dhikr that you were supposed to say as part of the sajda. So that's the ruling there. You don't have to worry about it. It's just one of your sajdas. You missed the, the dhikr in the sajda. Not a big deal because dhikr is not a rukna, as we've mentioned before. 
and you go back to sajda and this is your second sajda okay now one thing i did forget to mention was ayatollah khamenei's ruling in this regard and that is this he says no if you went to uh, you were going to sajda and your head bumped and came back up again that doesn't even count as anything he says then you would put your head back on the sajda and that would be your first sajda so there is a difference of ruling between ayatollah sisan and ayatollah khamenei uh, in this regard, we said if someone wants to do sajda but they can't bend over, bend over all the way, or they cannot prostrate on the ground, it's important for them to at least move as much as they can, and then the rest they can make up with putting the sajda on their head. What you find a lot of times is that if I can't do a full sajda, I'll just sit there. People will take the sajda and they'll put it on their head, and that's not the right way to do sajda for someone who isn't able to do it. Uh, fully okay we moved on from that we said another question that we answered is that if I go to sajda and I realize that I have placed my head on something that in fact is not something that I could do sajda on I go to sajda I figure out I put my head on the carpet for example you might be thinking oh well Sheikh, this never happens no it does happen when you're sleepy and you're doing fajr right and you don't want to turn on the lights because you don't want to wake up too much uh, <laughs> that happens sometimes when you go to sajda and you put your head um, on the carpet, for example, instead of where you're supposed to put it, right? Or, for example, I mentioned this last week as well, that for sisters, they might go to sajda and their hijab might be uh, between the forehead and the sajda, right? Or any other situation that comes up. What you're supposed to do is you're supposed to drag your head onto the sajda. You're not supposed to lift your head. That will make your namaz, as far as I can remember, that could that would make your namaz batil because it's like you went to sajda and you got up and you did sajda on something that was you weren't allowed to do sajda on right so it's like you did sajda kind of like you did sajda on purpose on carpet which we all know is a problem right um so that's the ruling there you're supposed to uh drag your head or you could just drag from underneath your head whatever it is that's a barrier between your forehead and the sajda. You could do that as well. Okay. Then we moved on to the topic of sajda sahav. We said sajda sahav. Again, this is one of those topics and concepts that I could promise you that 90% of people don't know the details to. And because of this, a lot of times their namaz is actually batil. Um, sajda sahav. What is sajda sahav? Sajda sahav is this. I'll explain what it is very quickly. Then I'll explain based on Ayatul Sistani and Ayatul Khamni when we are supposed to do sajda to sahwa he says sajda to sahwa is this where you after your namaz before doing the movement with the hands when you give your salam and your namaz finished or your salat finished then what you are going to do is you're going to go to sajda twice you can say any dhikr that you want in these two sajdas you will get up you will do another tashahud and a salam this is sajda to sahwa okay now this sajda that we do, and technically it's not really a sajda, it's two sajdas, one tashahud and one salam, right? But just for the, for the you know, for keeping things brief, we'll call it sajda to sahab. This, according to Ayatollah Sistani, is wajib in these uh, situations. Number one is when you missed a tashahud. Number two is when you spoke in namaz accidentally, right? And number three is when you gave extra salam, right? Um, these three situations are situations where you have to do sajda to saf, according to Ayatollah Sistani. Ayatollah Khamenei, he says, it's a little bit more than that. It's if you speak accidentally, if you forget one sajda, and also if you give salam when you're not supposed to give it, when you forget tashahud, or you remove a, a, a sajda when uh, you were supposed to do it. So if you add or take away a sajda, he says, you have to do sajda to saf. So these are situations where we have to do sajda to sah. Based on this, like for example, if you follow Ayatollah Khamenei, what that means is that if you missed a sajda, you would have to do this. Right when you say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, without doing the movements of the hands, what you would do is, you would first make up for that sajda, you would go to sajda and get up, and then you would have to do sajda to sah. That's what you would have to do. If that makes sense. For Ayatollah Sistani, uh, he said you don't have to make up for a sajda, you only have to make up for a tashahud. 
So for him, if you had to make up for a tashahud, if you missed a tashahud, you would say your tashahud, you would make up for it right after your namaz or your salat, and then you would do sajda to sahu as well. That's what you would need to do. And then we went through some of the mustahabbat and makruhat of sajda. And the only one that I really want to emphasize on is the idea of placing the elbows on the ground simply because I've had so many uh, kids ask me this that Shaykh our parents tell us that if you put your elbows on the ground for the men it makes your namaz or your salat batil and the answer is no it doesn't make the salat batil uh, it's just mustahab for them to have their elbows uh, in the air rather than on the ground <clears throat> so that's what we covered uh, in the previous session uh, today inshallah we're going to continue with the discussion move on uh, from this part to uh, the other part. Salam alaikum to everyone who's with us today. So I'm going to move on. We <clears throat> we reached this point. We said uh, we were we ended basically the topic of sajdas. I just want to share one. Uh, it's a beautiful hadith from one of the companions of uh, the sixth imam, if I'm not mistaken. Um, his name is Fadl ibn Shadan. Fadl ibn Shadan is a pretty famous companion of our imams. Uh, and he is explaining this story about the situation where he went into uh, Iraq. He went into, uh, he was basically visiting Iraq. Um, because at that time, Iraq was uh, very much a place where a lot of Shias were there. Uh, especially, you know, Kufa was like a big place uh, for Shias at that time. And... He says, when I entered into the city, uh, into, into Iraq, I saw two people, uh, they were sort of uh, a little bit of in a uh, argument, right? Um, and this story is about the idea of going to sajda and prolonging to the sajda. This idea of prolonging the sajda is one of those things that has a lot of emphasis in, in Islam, right? Um, that's why we have hadith that when someone is in sajda, out of all the different parts in your salat, when someone is in sajda, sajda that's the part that they have uh, the closest proximity towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Probably because, you know, it's the most humble uh, position that we will ever be in, in our whole lives, right? When you're placing your head on dirt in front of someone else. So this, this story is about prolonging the sajda and the way the companions of the imams used to do this. He says, when I entered Iraq, I saw two people. They were kind of in an argument. And one of them turned to his friend and he said, listen, you do sajda so long. It's not good for you. The sajda, it's not good for your body. You're doing it for too long. And this guy, he turned to his friend and uh, Fadl ibn Shaldan is saying, I was witnessing this. He says, I... Uh, saw him that his friend turned to him and he said well you're talking about my sajda being too long uh, what would you have done if you had seen uh, the sajda uh, of Muhammad ibn Abi Umair what would you do if you see his sajda because my sajda is nothing compared to his sajda so Fadl ibn Shadan says one day I actually got a chance and I came across Muhammad ibn Abi Umair and these are famous companions of the fifth and the sixth imam uh, very famous in the books of Rijal and the books of Chain of Narrators uh, or Chains of Narrators. They discuss the lives of these individuals. So he says, I had a chance to see Muhammad ibn Abi Umair in sajda. And he was in sajda for such a long time um, that when he got up, I told him, I said, wow, you were in sajda for such a long time. Muhammad ibn Abi Umair turned to me. He said, well, what would you say if you saw Jamil ibn Darraj? If you saw his sajda, that would be a totally different thing. <laughs> um, and Jamil ibn Darraj is another one of the famous companions of, of the fifth and sixth imam. Um, he says, I got another chance to see Jamil one time. And he did the same thing. He went into sajda for such a long time. And I asked him, I said, why would you do sajda for such a long time? He said, oh, you haven't seen this other companion of the imam. His name is Ma'ruf ibn Kharbuz. If you were to see him, what would you say uh, in that situation? So you see that these, and by the way, these were companions who were known for their knowledge, right? These were companions who have narrated quite a bit of ahadith for us, right? But this idea that uh, knowledge is one thing 
and worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a different thing, right? And that these two are for two separate individuals. Either you're the type who worships him and does ibadat or you're the type who's after knowledge. You find that with these early companions of the Imams, it wasn't like this at all. It was such that, you know, they, um, with their sajdas, people were surprised as to how their sajdas are continuing. Now, we don't need to do something like that. Um, but this idea of being in sajda uh, for longer times is something that's mentioned over and over. In that famous hadith of Amirul Mu'minin sallallahu alayhi when he's talking about this idea, he says, your imam, ala wa inna imamakum, he says, you should know that your imam has, uh, has taken from this world and he sufficed from this world. Uh, for he's just taken like one or two loaves of bread from this world and that's all he takes. Then he says, but you guys should know, he's referring to his Shia, that you guys know that you won't be able to do something like this. So at least help us uh, by wara'in wajtihadin, by working hard and being fearful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from what I remember, he, he also mentions watul sujud and that you make your sajdas uh, longer. So this idea of going to sajda, prolonging the sajda, just being in sajda and understanding what a, uh, you know, particular and, and unique situation and position it is, is something that has been emphasized uh, in our hadith. We mentioned the philosophy behind sajda about how you go back to earth and dirt and you come back up and all that stuff. So I'm not going to go over that again. Let's move on to tashahud. So with tashahud, uh, there isn't much to explain about the rulings. I do want to explain a little bit about the uh, philosophy behind it and the secret behind it. If you remember, we said that when someone goes to sajda the second time, it is a symbol of them dying and leaving this world. And then when they raise their head, it is a symbol of resurrection. Okay, so when they are being resurrected, the the scholars say that tashahud is supposed to be a manifestation of yawmul qiyamah a manifestation of the day of judgment and that is why the things that will show themselves and they will manifest themselves on the day of judgment will are the things that we say in tashahud so that's the philosophy and the secret behind it basically when someone is doing tashahud they are playing out the day of judgment in front of themselves, right? So what do we say in tashahud? We say, "Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la." There's only one God. There's no one who can be associated with Him, right? This is something that manifests itself and shows itself where yomul qiyamah, right? Now in this world, it shows itself to a certain degree, but it's difficult for people to see it really. In the next world, it manifests itself completely, right? That's why uh, in the verses of the Quran, it says that on that day, uh, no one is talking. The only person who's talking is God or anyone who God gives permission to. In this world, everyone is talking, right? In the next world, there is no talk. Um, nothing has reality except for what comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Uh, that's why the verses of the Quran say, لِمَنِ الْمُلْكُ الْيَوْمِ لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدِ الْقَهَارِ who has authority on this day? This is as opposed to this world where everyone had authority or a little bit of authority at least, right? So we say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la. That's one thing that will manifest itself on Yawmul Qiyamah. We say, Ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu rasuluh. People will see that in a lot more clearer way on Yawmul Qiyamah. And then we say, Salawat. Why do we say Salawat? Because we believe that the Ahlul Bayt are a link between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, this is not this is not shirk. And there's a long discussion to that. I'm not even going to get into that. I just want to share uh, one very quick hadith. It's a beautiful hadith from Imam Sadiq sallallahu alayhi He says that he was trying to, it's funny, it's interesting. He was trying to explain how zakatul fitra is what completes your fast. And the way he explains that is that when you say salawat in your prayer, it completes your prayer, right? <laughs> he says, so this is what the hadith says. He says, when you give zakatul fitra, zakatul fitra completes your fast. The same way when you say salawat, salawat completes your prayer as well, right? 
Why? Because when someone doesn't say salawat, in other words, they're not acknowledging this link between themselves and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hadith says that if someone does their salat uh, without a salawat, salaka bi salatihi ghayra sabil al jannah wa la tuqbal salat, wa la tuqbal salatuhu, right? Uh, meaning that he's moved in a different direction than, than Jannah, basically. So this is the philosophy uh, behind Tashahud. We don't really have too many rulings that I need to cover with regards to Tashahud. There's only a couple points I'll mention and we'll move on to Salam, where we actually have some rulings um, that we need to discuss. First is that in Tashahud, it's mustahab to have the right uh, foot over the left foot while you're sitting, right? And uh, many people may not know this, but in Tashahud, you can sit in different ways. It's actually not wajib to sit uh, in the particular way that we all that we normally sit. It's mustahab to sit that way, but uh, anyone can sit in any in any way that basically you want. Um, but this idea of putting the right foot over the left foot is just to symbolize uh, truth over falsehood, and this is also uh, mentioned in some of our hadith. For sisters, it's mustahab that the thighs be closer to one another, and it's mustahab that when one is in uh, tashahud, that his eyes be uh, right at his knees. Again, this is to show humility in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's interesting that when you look at the verses of the Quran, they also speak of the same idea, that on that day, people, when they are humble and they feel humiliated, uh, those who are wrongdoers will feel humiliated in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The way this happens is their eyes are down. Now, in some of these verses, their eyes are down because of embarrassment. In some of these verses, their eyes are down because they don't want to see uh, the punishment that awaits them. For different reasons, their eyes are down, right? Uh, but as the Quran says, خَاشَعَةً أَبْصَارُهُمْ تَرْحَقُهُمْ ذِلَّةً their eyes are down, their eyes are khasha, meaning it's it's looking downwards. Tarhakuhum dhilla, and they are covered with humiliation, right? But anyways, when we are in tashahud, we want to show that humility. That's why even the eyes have a place in tashahud. It's mustahab to say Bismillah wa billah walhamdulillah wa khayrul asma illillah, which is what many of the uh, you know the imams when they're leading their prayers, they say it in their prayers. And it's also mustahab to say, وَتَقَبَّلْ شَفَاعَتَهُ وَرْفَعَ دَرَجَتَهُ uh, Oh Allah, accept the shafa'ah and the intercession of the Prophet, وَرْفَعَ دَرَجَتَهُ And also uh, ascend his level or elevate his, his level basically. Okay, let's move on from that and let's move on to uh, Salam. Let me just check and see if we have uh, any questions. Yes, uh, Brother Hadi is asking, uh, Salam Alaikum to everyone who's joined us. Brother Hadi is asking, Salam Alaikum wa Alaikum Salam. Anyone can sit in any way. Thank you for mentioning this. Yes, uh, in Tashahud, of course. Yes, there's different ways to sit, uh, obviously. <laughs> and um, you can sit in any way that you want, technically, in Tashahud. Even though if you were to do that, I think in a lot of centers, a lot of people would come up and uh, tell you that your namaz, your salat is batil. <laughs> but, but technically, uh, you're allowed to do that. Okay, moving on to salam. Very important ruling regarding salam is this. Which part of salam is actually wajib? When we're growing up in Sunday schools and in Saturday schools, or even if your parents are teaching you this stuff about, or teaching us about prayer, they will teach you that after tashahud, you're supposed to give three salams. Uh, truth of the matter is that these three salams are not wajib. Only one of them is wajib. And even out of that one that is wajib, there's debate as to whether the whole thing is wajib or only a part of it is wajib, right? So in salat, we give three salams. You say, assalamu alaikum, ayyuhan nabi, assalamu alayna. And then the third one, which is assalamu alaikum. The only one that is wajib is actually is actually the third one, and this is for Ayatollah Sistani and Ayatollah Khamenei. They both say the only one that is wajib is the third one. Um, and this is really important to understand. Why? Before we mentioned that if you give an extra salam, you're supposed to do sajda to sahu, right? So this only re uh, refers 
or applies to the wajib part of Sanam. So if I'm in the second rakah and I'm praying a four rakat prayer, um, if I say Assalamu alaikum ayyuhan nabi wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Assalamu alayna wa ala, and then I remember that, oh, I'm in my second rakah, I don't have to do anything. I just get up and continue with my prayer. Yes. Uh, if I get to the third part of my uh, salam and I say assalamu alaikum, then yes, I would have to do sajdatu sahwa at the end of my uh, prayer. So now that we understand that salam is actually the last part of our salat, this thing that people do, and we know, of course, this is mustahab to do takbir uh, three times. And let me just make something clear. This is not mustahab. Right? That's what a lot of people do. Um, what's mustahab is to bring the hands all the way up to the ears, like the takbirs that we did, we were talking about at the beginning of salat. So when people do this, this is not the end of your salat. The moment you say assalamu alaikum uh, and fra'at al-sistani wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, that is going to be the end of your salat. The hand movement is something that's mustahab. It actually follows uh, the Salat. It's not actually uh, part of the Salat. Okay, now, um, and the reason why I mention this is that a lot of people who are in Jama'at, when they're praying their Jama'at, they'll say Assalamu Alaikum before the Imam has even got there, but they won't do the hand thing because they think the hand thing is what ends the Salat, when that's not really what ends the Salat. So allow me to explain a little bit about the secrets behind salam and this, this part is very beautiful because salam in particular and the way it's done um, and the details of it these were legislated while the prophet was in mi'raj right as is the case with many of the other parts of salat as well so hadith says that he was in salat he was in mi'raj and he was commanded to uh, in fact uh, you know perform salat and he was given the idea of you do the tashahud and you do the salawat. And then hadith says that when he paid attention, he saw that angels and other prophets have surrounded him. And he was told uh, he was told to give salam. فقال, so the prophet said this, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. He was giving salam to the angels and to these prophets and messengers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to him with regards to the meaning of this salam. He said, Anni as salam wa tahiyya wa rahma. I am salam, I am tahiyya, and I am the mercy that you find in this phrase, as salamu alaykum. And then he said, wa barakatuhu refers to you and your children. So basically, it's like this the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala coming uh, upon us, uh, basically as far as we can understand this hadith. Now, um, when in famous hadith, Imam Ali was asked, why is it that we end our namaz with salam or our salat with salam? He said this, and this is important to, to explain to our children. He said that salam itself means peace and immunity and protection, right? He said the reason why you end your salat with salam is because the moment you have finished your salat, you are now in peace, you are now immune to the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? That's why we have hadith that if you, if someone's salat is ex uh, accepted from them, then all of their other actions are also accepted. If not, then their other actions are not accepted from them, right? So he says, because salam, the salam that you give at the end of the prayer, because it's the end of the prayer, and you are now walking away from your prayer, you are now in silm, as we say in Arabic. You are in peace. You are immune from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why we end our prayer with salam. Who are we giving this salam to? In the footsteps of the Prophet, if he wanted to walk, uh, hadith again from Imam Sadiq says that one of his companions asked about this and he said that you would be giving salam to the two angels on the two sides uh, of us, right? On the right shoulder and the left shoulder, the two angels that are uh, always with us, right? This is not Nakir and Munkar. Those are two different angels that come inside of the grave. These are the two angels that write down the good and bad deeds uh, that we have. 
So this is why this word salam, when you look at it in our hadith and in the verses of the Quran, everywhere God wants to give a person a feeling of peace, a feeling that there's no harm coming their way, this word salam is used. That's why the Quran talks about heaven. It says, Lahum Darus Salam. For them is a house of salam, a house of peace, a house where no harm comes your way. That's why when we come to one another, we say assalamu alaikum, meaning no harm is gonna come to you from you know from me. In terms of me, you're safe, you're immune, and you are in peace. In heaven, this is what the people in heaven hear. Salamun qawlan min Rabbin Rahim. They will hear salam from their Lord. Right? Or, for example, when they come into heaven, the malaika continuously say salam to them. Salamun alaikum, tibtum, welcome, tibtum, what a great, you know, hopefully you have a great time. That's what tibtum means. Fadkhuluha uh, khalidi, go in there and stay in there uh, forever. So, this is the meaning of salam. That's why we end our salat with salam, because it, you are now immune, basically, and in peace. Uh, in terms of uh, the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, let me just check, see if we have any questions. No questions so far. So uh, we will be ending in just about 10 or so minutes. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to send them in and uh, we will answer them as we move on. Okay, uh, moving on, I'm going to talk a little bit about ta'aqibat of prayer. And if we have a chance, we'll move on to the mubtilat of prayer as well. So what am I supposed to do for ta'aqibat? We know that ta'aqibat is important. Um, one thing that I will say that we can understand from our hadith is that more important from ta uh, than ta'aqibat is to do the namaz in a, to pace yourself in namaz. That's probably more important than doing ta'aqibat. I've seen multiple people who will rush through their salat and then they will do a bunch of ta'aqibat afterwards as well. Um, in the words of the imams, he says that if someone rushes through salat, they're doing injustice to the salat, right? Uh, he mentioned in some of the hadith that people who go to the second sajda and they quickly get up without sitting, we know that's wajib, he said these are people who do dhulm, they're doing injustice uh, to the salat. So ta'aqibat is important, but more important than that is that when we are speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we at least pace ourselves and take our time with that. Okay, now with regards to ta'aqibat, it's interesting, there's a person who asked Imam Sadiq, he said, if I don't have time to do my ta'aqibat, what should I do? Because I have to go, for example. He said, in kunta ala wudu in, he said, if you still have your wudu, while you have your wudu, it's as if you are doing your taqibat. However, we do know that taqibat is important. What should we do for taqibat? There's three things that I'll mention here. Obviously, the first one is tasbihat of Lady Fatima. We know the importance of this. Beautiful hadith says, مَا عَبِدَ اللَّهُ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ التَّمْجِيدَ there's nothing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been worshipped through better or more beautiful than the tasbihat of Lady Fatima. And then look at this, there's an argument here to prove this. He says, وَلَوْ كَانَ شَيْءٌ أَفْضَلَ مِنْ If there was anything better than that, لَنَحَلَهُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ مِنْ فَاطِمَةً The Prophet would have gifted that thing to, the, to Lady Fatima. The fact that he gifted this tasbihat means that there was nothing better. The, uh, than this to do, right? So that's one of the ta'aqibat. Another one is this dua. Actually, let me see if I can just copy paste this in the comments section for you guys. Very short dua and very beautiful dua that's mentioned for us uh, to do after. Yes, here we go. So the dua is this Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min ilmin la yanfa. There's one dua that shaykhs are really supposed to do. <laughs> Um, ya Allah, I seek refuge in you from knowledge that doesn't help me. وَقَلْبٍ لَا يَخْشَى And a heart that's hard, a heart that uh, isn't humble. وَنَفْسٍ لَا تَشْبَعْ And an ego that will never be satisfied, right? وَدُعَاءٍ لَا يُسْمَعْ And a dua that, will, that is not here. اللَّهُمَّ إِنِّي أَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْ هَؤُلَاءِ الْأَرْبَعَ Ya Allah, I seek refuge in you from these four. This is another one of the things that's mentioned 
as part of the taqibat. And the last one is sajda to shukr, right? Hadith mentions that once you do your salat, you thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you got a chance to do your salat, go to sajda, and you do sajda to shukr. So these are some of the uh, taqibat of salat. Okay, let me take a quick look, uh, see if we have any questions. And we will move on. If anyone has any questions regarding anything that they will want to ask, please go ahead and do that because we will be ending in uh, five or so minutes. Brother Hadi has asked, I have an off-topic question. No problem. Is it okay to do Salat Jama'at behind Sunni brother even though they recite part of second surah? As far as I know, Ayatollah Khamenei allows this. Uh, he says, if it's done with the intention of preserving unity, it's fine. Ayatul Sistani also allows this. He just says that the Hamd and the Surah you would have to recite quietly to yourself, uh, by yourself basically, right? So he says you have to recite the Hamd and the Surah, uh, like basically you're doing it. It's as if the Imam is not doing it on your behalf. Um, so that's the ruling in that regard. Okay, let me move on to uh, the Mubtilat of Salat so that we can at least set a foundation here. And then uh, we'll probably continue with it next week. So, Mubtilat of Salat. What are the things that makes our Salat batin? Some of these are pretty simple. I'll just fly through them. Some of them, no, they need a little bit more explanation, right? So, the first one is losing one of the conditions of prayer, right? If the place that I'm praying or my sajdaqah becomes najis, for example. Or I figure out, oh, it's not even time yet. So, we're not going to go into that. We discuss all the conditions of prayer before. If anyone wants to figure out the ruling of any of those, they can go back to the archives, archive sessions, which uh, are on YouTube also, by the way. Um, number two is if your wudu or ghusl becomes batin. This one is probably the worst one because there's no leeway. Uh, wudu or ghusl becomes batil, that's it. Your namaz is batil. Uh, you just get up and you can just get up and walk away basically, right? Um, one thing that I will mention is that as long as you're not sure that your wudu or ghusl has become batil, then you would consider it to be valid. In particular, with the idea of falling asleep, um, if you're not sure if you fell asleep, uh, if you're not sure that maybe, you know, I wasn't actually asleep, as long as you're not sure, then your wudu is fine. Uh, similarly, with the other muktilat of wudu, it's the same thing. As long as you're not 100% sure, then you have your wudu and your ghusl. Number three, and sort of number three and number four, is doing what we call takattuf. What is takattuf? Takattuf is basically what our Sunni brothers and sisters do, placing the two hands just like this uh, in your salat. There is a discussion, and this is one of those places where the ruling is uh, slightly different amongst different uh, maraja. So I'm not going to really go into detail. Um, but takattuf and saying amin after suratul hamd, these two are considered mutilat of salat if they are done uh, on purpose, right? Why? We consider these to be uh, we consider these to be things that we don't have proof for you to do in your salat. And therefore, if you do it, then uh, you're you're basically changing the salat, which is something that is not supposed to be uh, changed because the details of salat are something that come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's number three and four. I really don't want to go too much into that. We do know that saying Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen is mustahab. Why? Because hadith says that you should say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen after Suratul Hamd. But you can't say Ameen. Why? Because hadith has never said, at least from, from the Shia perspective, hadith has never said that you are supposed to say uh, Ameen or that it is prescribed to say uh, Ameen uh, after Suratul Hamd. Uh, there is like, you know, sometimes people, speakers or teachers or they, we sometimes we get into this mode where we try to explain the reason behind every little thing in Salat, right? But no, we don't know why. I mean, I'm sure there are there are reasons. We know philosophically that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a reason behind every one of these rulings. But do we know the reason behind these rulings? No, a lot of them have not been shared with us. So if someone asks us, and I'm saying this because this is a discussion that always comes up in the Sunni Shia dialogue, right? That uh, why do you put your head on turba? 
And some of us will respond, we'll, say, we'll put our head on Torba because it shows you the utmost humility that you're putting, like you're putting your head on dirt and stuff like that, which might be true, might be the reason, except for the fact that you don't always have to put your head on dirt, number one. And number two, we don't even know if that's really the reason or not, right? Why is it that you hold your hand, you don't hold your hands while other schools of thought, uh, some of them hold their hand, right? As far as I know, the Maliki school of thought uh, doesn't do it that way. Uh, if I'm, you know, uh, hopefully I'm not mistaken, but I do remember one of the schools of thought within Ahl Sunnah does not do it that way. Okay, so what's the reason? And then you'll find some of our brothers and sisters. Yes, the reason is because like it shows your humility if you put no. We don't know the reason. That's it's it's very plain and simple. All the only thing is anything we want to do in salat. We need a hadith or a verse of the Quran telling us to do it. We don't have that. That's the difference. For other schools of thought, they have that. For us, we don't have that. So that's why we consider it to not be okay. That's why we say if you do takatuf, you're making your salat uh, batil, basically, right? So I've seen I've seen a lot of people get into this discussion. Even speakers sometimes they get into this discussion about. Uh, or for example, why do we do salat uh, combined, for example, instead of doing it five times a day, or I shouldn't say five times a day, but five times separately, right? They'll go into why we do it that way and stuff like that. Well, the reason why we do it that way is because hadith says it's allowed to do it that way. That's more than enough reason for us, right? Um, the reason why I'm saying this is because we don't know the reasoning behind a lot of these uh, details. Okay, so if someone does any of these two Accidentally, it will uh, accidentally is okay, but on purpose is going to make their salat bat. Number four, turning away from the qibla, and there is this is even if you turn less than ninety degrees from the qibla, your namaz, be, your salat becomes bat. So that if you remember that ninety degrees is accidentally, right? Yes, accidentally you can go to ninety degrees, um, but. On purpose, no, you can't move away from the Qibla at all. So if your body moves from the Qibla to one direction enough that people say he's not facing the Qibla, he's facing like 20, minute degree, uh, 20 minutes or 10, 20 degrees away from the Qibla, then the Salat becomes Batil as well. And number five is speaking in prayer. When we speak in prayer, of course, if it's accidental, we are going to do Sajda to Sahwa like we talked about last week. Uh, and we discussed this week as well. Inshallah, next week we'll talk about this situation. If I say something because I want someone to understand something, like someone is walking around, I want them to do something. Maybe I don't have a torba. I want someone to give me a torba. Can I say, like, Allahu Akbar, or can I say, Alhamdulillah, or can, I know that I can't just speak to him, right? But can I do one of these to get his attention and hopefully, like, have him do something for me? We'll discuss that, inshallah, in the next session. Okay. Uh, one more question uh, as we're about to end. Brother Hadi is asking, on wudu, is it a problem if you touch outside water while you are washing your left or right arm or even your face? No, Brother Hadi, it's not a problem. The only thing you would have to do is you would have to make the intention that this water that's, that didn't come originally from your face, um, you are. this is also part of your wudu. That's all. You just have to make that intention. And normally we make that intention anyways. So if you make that intention, it's not a problem. The only place where this will be a problem is when someone is going to do a mess. When you're doing mess, you have to use the water that's left on your hands. So any other water comes that will be uh, a problem, basically. Okay. Thank you very much, brothers and sisters, for being with us. Um, if you guys have any questions, uh, you can uh, always send us a message in Mizan Institute's uh, basically Facebook page. One thing I want to mention before we end, inshallah, please do let us know for the month of Muharram whether you would uh, prefer uh, to continue with Ahkam. And if you do, what topics would you like to discover? Uh, not discover. Uh, <laughs> Ahkam shouldn't be discovered. Uh, <laughs> what topics should you like to explore, I should say? Um, and or would you prefer uh, for us to do tafsir? Um, we did have feedback from some of you guys in the previous session, but please do let us know for the rest of you guys who haven't um, pitched, uh, basically gave us your input. Let us know if you would prefer tafsir or you prefer 
uh, continuation of ahkam. Uh, Sister Fiz is asking, during Salat, if your child begins to cry, can we hold him or comfort the child in any way? Yes, we'll talk about that next week, inshallah. If the child starts crying, you can do quite a bit of things, actually. Um, and uh, there is quite a bit of movement that's allowed in Salat. Within our communities, it's normally understood that it's, it's not understood that way. But yes, we actually have quite a bit of hadith about that, and we'll discuss that next week. As long as what you're doing, when people are looking at you, they will say, this person is still in the state of Salat. As long as you've not broken that position in that state, then uh, you are good. I don't want to go into too much detail about it, because there's a hadith that I, I haven't pulled up yet. I'll pull it up and we'll talk about it, inshallah, next session. Thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.